In the meantime, God is still keeping his promise, even the ones that he made in the old covenant, even to the, his old covenant people, because they have not yet returned to him. But they will return to him, and in the 11th hour, just before the midnight hour, just like the parables of Jesus say, just like the life of Joseph and other people, you know, illustrate, in the midnight hour, those people will come back to Jesus. When the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, then, then the Jews will see the Lord. They will recognize God and they will come back. And so even though they've been spread everywhere, God says not one grain is going to fall upon the earth. When I see the nation of Israel, I think how good God is and how trustworthy he is in my own personal life. Think about any word that the Lord's ever given you. If not one grain falls to the ground, that means not one sentence, not one letter in any sentence God's ever spoken over your life will fall to the ground. If you will just but follow. I'll tell you what right now, there's a lot of words that the Lord's spoken to you. That even if you don't follow, they still will come to pass. Most of those, however, tend to fall in the category of the ones that we don't always want to come to pass. So it's better to get on God's side and say, Lord, everything that you've said about me that's for good. huh? I know, Jeremiah said, the, the plans I have for you, plans for you to prosper, plans for you to have an expected end, plans for your dreams to come true. I know those plans. Those are my plans. and Those are the plans that I want to come to pass. And if you just move with God, you don't have to know much about it. Just say, yes, Lord. God, you said this. I agree. I say, man, those things will come to pass. Verse 10 says not, or verse 9 says, not the least grain shall fall upon the earth. I'll tell you, not the least of the words for this church will fall if we just keep our eyes on Jesus. And say, Lord, not our, not our way, not our programs, not what some other church is doing, not what somebody said is successful, not what somebody said the latest thing is, not what the latest round of sermons, you know, are on the internet. You know, we can't do those things. We have to do God's things. I think at the end of the day, one of the hardest things for us to do is just, is just stop, quiet our flesh, and yield to God. And it's so much easier if, to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Even today, 2011, it's so much easier to just reach up there and pluck one of those things. Because, you know, it's something that makes sense to me. You know, I think God does things like this. That's how a lot of Christians live. And they walk around, very, it looks very intelligent, you know, eating on an apple, biting an apple, wearing their small bifocal glasses, little professor's goatee. I think. It's not what I think, it's what God thinks. It's the tree of life that we want to eat from, man. Who's the tree of life? Jesus is the tree of life. He was the tree. He's the illustration. He's in the middle of the garden. He's the one that walked with Adam and Eve in garden. He's the one that came down in the cool of the evening. He's the one that interjected his will and their will and his will. They, they were all morphed together, man. And they were just walking in unison. I mean, Jesus would just eat of the tree of life. Just keep hanging on to Jesus. This is why when Jesus came, the people that recognized him, they just did one thing. They just did whatever it took to get to him. There was always the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was always a religious institution somewhere. There was always a new doctrine. There was always a new teaching. But the people that got something from Jesus in the four gospels, what did they do? Simply came to Jesus. Thinking of the woman with the issue of blood. What did she do to get such a great miracle? She just reached out and touched the hem of his garment. Knowing that the hem, you know, of a rabbi's garment, a hem of a priest's garment had healing promise in it. It was sewn into it. I mean, you can read in there the name of Yahweh. And so they knew, man, this is God. Grab the hem of that garment and I'll be changed. Grab onto Jesus and I'll be all right. It doesn't matter who I am. It doesn't matter if it's been 12 or 18 years. It doesn't matter what people think of me or what my reputation has become. The only thing that matters is can I get a hold of God? This sermon's pretty good so far, and we just got in the beginning, in the very introduction of it. Notice verse 10. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword. Man, this is a hard word. Which say the evil shall not overtake. Somebody say overtake. God said, listen, don't listen to evil people. Who are the evil people? They're the ones that were saying contrary things to what the thus saith the Lord was saying. They were saying, oh, it's going to be fine. Everything's going to be like it always was. You know, the Bible says that in the end of the days, I think it's Peter that said, the people of God will actually say things are always going to be like they were. 
Just like back in the fathers who were sleeping, back in their day, things are going to be like, everything's going to be all right. Don't look for the signs of the times. Don't listen. Don't incline a discerning ear to the Lord. Everything's going to be okay. I tell you, that can sound really, really good, but that can be really, really evil. God says right here, the sword is going to overtake those people. Those people are what is known as sinners. People that should know better, but continue to do their own thing, even though they're amongst the people that are called by the name of the Lord. They say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. I think the word overtake is important. I want you to remember it tonight. It's a word that the Lord's put on my heart recently. Now, verse 11, in that day, what day? In that day. When God's bringing all the people back from wherever that they've been scattered, when he's not leaving one grain out, when he's remembering every single one, every single son, daughter, every single word that he's spoken in that day. In the day that's opposite from what the false prophets and the false teachers are saying. After the day has gotten bad, after the day has gotten worse, after the sword has been unsheathed that the Lord predicted, after that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David. It's an interesting concept. It's found a couple of times in the Bible, but we don't hear much teaching about it. I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and close up the breaches. Now, like I said before, Amos was one of the first prophets in the Old Testament, so he was closer to the time of David and Solomon than every other prophet, like I said, except, I think, Jonah. So he understood maybe more about exactly what the tabernacle of David was. I want to talk to you tonight just a little bit here um, about what kind of system existed in Israel in the time of David. There's obviously in your Bible, maybe you've studied it out, there's the tabernacle of Moses in the Old Testament. There was no temple yet built. Solomon built the temple. But God gave Moses instructions for a tabernacle. It was basically a big tent that was to be... uh, uh, in the encampment of God's people in the, very, you know, in the very center, in a certain place in the center of God's people when they camped out in the wilderness. And later then it was moved to different places as they moved over to the promised land. And this is how they worship God with certain uh, rituals, uh, certain priests and things like that. The Ark of the Covenant was in the very holiest of holies. There was a veil to, between. They could only minister, you know, in, in the certain sections uh, that were outside the veil. But the high priest could go in once a year there, and that continued in the temple. Are you here tonight? But an interesting thing happened in the day of David. Now, listen to me, and you might want to write this down. I always say that David, more than any other person, was a New Testament saint living in Old Testament times. 